job of composing, compiling, and curating a book of awesome life hacks of yesteryear, things that worked then that work now. So uh, I'm gonna introduce these two gals. One of them is a tarot advisor. One of them is a cat humorist. <laughs> One of them graduated from the School of Rock. <laughs> Which one's that? You can guess. You'll figure it out by the end of, of our party here, our hour-long ordeal, uh, the celebration of this amazing book. And one of them, if not both of them, well, no, life coach and both writers. Ladies and gentlemen, Susie Schubert, Angie Bailey. Can we talk about how this book came to be? Because it's like three years in the making. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. I'm going to give you the mic, and Thank you. <laughs> well, I am a big Gen X pop culture nerd. So I love writing humor about cats and Gen X. And so uh, I wanted to do something that was from my childhood because I love Little House on the Prairie. I loved, you know, all those shows that we grew up with. It was just sort of... Um, it's, it, there's a nostalgia to it that's a comfort. And so Susie and I decided we wanted to do something together. And so we signed on together, and she's a life coach, and I'm a humor writer. And so we came up with a book where we go back and take lessons mostly from the TV show. There are quite a few book references as well. But for us, the nostalgia came from the TV show. And we started writing it during COVID. So it was really just the perfect timing for that. Yeah, yeah, it was really quite interesting. Um, you know, the book came about because as we were thinking about Little House on the Prairie, you know, we found ourselves binge watching that show during the pandemic. Not forced, you weren't forced to binge we watch it. We were not this forced, okay, yes. no. Um, because it just seemed like something that just fit what we were going through in so many ways and we started to think about how wow so many of these things that they did go through and that were important to them are so relevant to who we are today um yeah you know it's a funny thing because it's one of those things where life was not easier by any means in the pioneer days i mean obviously they didn't have technology they didn't have all the modern conveniences but it was simpler in the sense that they weren't multitasking, right? They were on the farm, they were cleaning, cooking, and all those things were survival. Yeah. So they didn't have to try to think of all the different things that they needed to do. And so in a way that makes life seem simpler. And, you know, they were able to focus on their values, their focus on their community. They really counted on each other. Faith, family, community, yep. gratitude. All of that. And so we just were really like, let's bring some of that, you know, to the modern pioneer. So back to the pandemic, we ended up, you know, it, it was interesting to see how all of us got back to that wanting that cozy together time. Even though we couldn't be together, so many of us, we really craved that and we found ways to connect, you know, thanks to the internet. Which of course, they back then. Um, but it also was fun for us because, you know, Angie would come over, and this was pre uh, the vaccine, so we had to be really careful. But we found that we didn't really connect as much sometimes on Zoom, even though we did write a lot that way. So did you have like responsibly distanced collaboration sessions? Yeah, we would yeah. gather on my porch. And freezing, we had a, my husband, you know, put a heater up on the top, and we would sit on the porch, like, oh, how many feet away from each oh, other, with our masks on, and just kind of thinking about how, oh my gosh, think how cold it was in Dismet, you know, that long winter. And it was way colder than what we were dealing with. And it just was such a great way to per pers put perspective on what we were doing. Totally. Can you so. imagine if they had had, like, just heaters that they could just hang up? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I mean, Paul's going to play the fiddle. Electricity. Yeah. 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 Electricity. But right. one of the things that was... How are we going to process this deer? <laughs> no food processor. Yeah. <laughs> That'll never happen. No, 
know, but one of the things that was really clear to us is how important community and family was. They really had to depend on each other because they didn't have, if the crops failed, you know, because of weather, yeah. then they had to go find other work to pay the bills. And sometimes they had to walk 100 miles to find work. You know, in, in, the, in the, I don't know if you remember that episode where Pa had to walk 100 miles and he found a job in, uh, in, in a quarry. Yes, it's very with explosive. dynamite. Yes, it was yeah. explosive. <laughs> yeah, explosive. It was explosive. So yeah, so they had to kind of go out there. Pa was always having a side gig, you know. He was always making wagon wheels for people, and so yeah, so it was it was. He had no boundaries when it came to making wagon wheels. It was yeah. just, he just forced it on people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what you need is a wagon wheel. You need a wagon wheel. So anyway, so that kind of came to us too because we thought, especially in the gig economy these days, when a lot of people are. Know, doing things and working for themselves people are hustling and you know putting together different jobs in order to create an income and they were doing it back then too yeah there is a lot of mirroring in that pi simpler pioneer frontiersman frontierswoman lifestyle that applies to us now we're not all cultivating food but we're cultivating content we're cultivating relationships we're cultivating mm -hmm. and that's something that never ends and so I think that's what's really cool about this book and you know, a lot of people may be like, well, there's not as much of the Laura Ingalls Wilder's books in this as there is the TV show. And I think for us, the TV show, we, we both read the books and we reread the books when we were writing this, and that was really fun to go back as adults and read those books again. Um, but I think for us, we felt such an attachment to that show. I think people that aren't that didn't go through the Gen X generation maybe forget how we were such latchkey kids. So our parents were working, and what were we doing? We were watching things like The Brady Bunch, Little House on the Prairie, and just connecting. Those families felt like our families. And so for us, writing this book, that's really what we glommed on to a lot. And plus, I mean, come on, you can't help but laugh at Pa's glistening chest, <laughs> you know, the tears, and the punching with Mary and Laura, like punching out Nellie and all of that stuff. I mean, it was beautiful so melodrama. Much, yeah. So much drama, so much drama, yeah. <laughs> and the funny parts too. But I don't know. I, do you want to share a part of uh, your favorite part of the book? Yeah. What's your favorite hack? Oh. Yeah. Hacks. Boy. A couple of life hackers up here. Yeah. 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 Well, the hacks are a real mix of practical hacks and also more emotional kind of hacks. So I'd say one of my favorite practical hacks, I guess this is kind of emotional too, but it's a lot of times when we do our tasks, whether it's work or cleaning, cooking, whatever we're doing, we get in this mindset that we have to do this. We have to get this done. Even we have to go to work every day. And if we stop and think, really think about it, those things are a choice. We have a choice. Now, even the Ingalls had a choice. They could have not worked. They could have not farmed. They wouldn't have survived. But that was their choice to do what they needed to do. Pa's choice to you know, take these jobs and they would go, he and his friends would walk for miles until they found work. A lot of times they'd stop and they'd say, no, there's no work for you. They'd have to keep going until they found something. That was his choice. He wasn't gonna sit around and, and wait for something to come to him. And we can be like that too. We can remember that when we get up and go to work, when we're grumpy and we're tired, it's a choice we're making. Cause you know what? If we want to, we could live on the road you know, eating questionable mushrooms, camping, you know, relying on people to just like give us food if we ask for it. I mean, people do that. Yeah. And so people love it's that life. It's a life choice. Yeah. It's a life choice. So I, I like just being reminded that it, I think it just makes you feel more in control of your life when you know realize that everything we do is a choice. Do you have a favorite practical hack, Angie? I do. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you can all sort of uh, picture yourself maybe at a gathering or your work or your, you know, somewhere in a group of people and you just want to get out of there. <laughs> you know, and you know, sometimes maybe you have a signal with 
your partner, you know, this means you just need to make up a story <laughs> and get out of there. And so one of our chapters is about uh, hacking your relationships. And so we talk a lot about communication there and how you can um, bond more with your partner. And uh, one of the ways that we kind of took from that is, uh, is coming up with a code word or coming up with something that's kind of fun that, uh, that you can have a giggle about, especially later. And I just think laughter is so, so, uh, so much fun and so much a part of what makes uh, friendships and what makes uh, any kind of relationship strong. So yeah, so that's, that was my favorite hack. And I had, we had made a note here about what would it sound like if Laura and Manly found themselves stuck in Harriet Olson's gossip web at the mercantile. <laughs> <laughs> so you can all pick up this case study, right? Right? <laughs> right? So Harriet would say, well, I heard Doc Baker's having a clandestine affair with Alice Garvey. And they're having secret indoor picnics on his exam table. What do you think of that? <laughs> Could happen. That's not too far out there, right? And then Laura might say, Manly, did I leave the squirrel stew leftovers uncovered? <laughs> and Manly says, oh, we better get home and check. We don't want the field mice to get mad. it. <laughs> so, you know, they're coming with squirrel stew. <laughs> so, that could be your stew. Feel free to take it. Take it, take it. So, <laughs> so yeah, so make, make, anything that's kind of fun that you can have just between you and your partner, or you and your friend, um, as a way to bond, that's my favorite. That's your own. I think um, one of the other ones is actually a uh, prairie challenge, which we have at the end of every chapter. So we have hacks throughout the chapters, okay. and then at the end we have a challenge for you to do at the end of the chapter. And I think my favorite one is because I have done it already, and I cannot tell you how it changed my life, having a solo adventure. Going somewhere all by yourself. And you know what? It doesn't have to be. I was lucky. You can all hate me now. I had um, some Get friends. Ready for it. I had some friends that lived Brace in yourself. the island of St. Thomas, and they needed to, to house watch <laughs> for three oh. weeks. Oh. For three weeks. So and, adventure. Yeah, my husband had to work, and he's like, "I can't do it." I'm like, "I can." I, I volunteer as tribute. Yeah. <laughs> So I spent three weeks in St. Thomas, uh, driving on the wrong side of the road, figuring out I worked during, you know, half the day. Amazing self-discovery. Found, yeah, that. found the nearest beach and was just like, I'm going to lay on the beach. And again, it doesn't have to be something that glamorous or exotic. Even if you just like said, I'm out of here and you, you got a hotel room, even for one night by yourself. A solo trip by yourself. You learn so much about yourself. Kara's going, yep. Yeah. There's, a lot, of, there's a lot of head nodding right now. Like, you learn so much about yourself. Yeah, solo adventure is where it's at. Yeah, it's yeah. incredible. So that's a challenge for you with this book. So we would love to hear if you do that. Did you want to share any of your others? Or are we going to read something from the book? Oh, I think, listen, why don't we start reading from the book? Want to start reading? OK. Real quick, I had one question. Oh, yes. You mentioned earlier TV. You chose to go more the TV route and source from that the show than the book, or the books. What brought that on? What, what kind of influenced that? Yeah, well, yeah. it was just more than a, a piece of nostalgia for us, yeah. you know, because yeah. as she said, Latchkey. As probably as Latchkey, yeah, pop culture. You know, we came home, Gen and we were like yeah. poor John Ann bowl of cereal and sit in front of the TV. And, you and know, there's your surrogate parents on TV. I yeah. know, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then yeah. 10 minutes before, you know, your parents get home, you run around to your chores, so. <laughs> <laughs> like, I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't. Oh, no, 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 no. We were binging and we didn't even know what that was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And what's interesting is we're not alone in that because everybody that we talk to that loves the little house has such a strong feeling about it. The, the characters, the family, the, the memories that we have of watching it, the people that love it really, really, really love that show. And the books too. The books too. And the, and the books, um, one thing that's really interesting about the books is that Laura Ingalls Wilder didn't write it until she was 63 years old. So she was reaching back to her childhood, and so a lot of it. Do you remember? I saw that question, and I thought it was either like she was 18 years old. No, this was literally wow. That's that's wild, and that life expectancy mm -hmm. to hit that age is a 
Right. Yeah. So she was relying on her memory, and so a lot of it is, um, you know, I, I think life was a little bit harder than you know what she indicated in the books and on the TV show. Um, but yeah, so she, so that also tells you you can start a new career at age 63. <laughs> true. <laughs> true facts. Yes. yes, yes, yes. So anyway, yeah. Should we read? Yeah. Let's read. Yeah. Little we'll story time. We're gonna listen. Little story time. You want to go first? Do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll start. I wanted to read the introduction for everybody because, I don't know, we we had so much fun with this introduction, didn't we? We were just... Do you remember, could you paint a little picture around like when the introduction was birthed? <laughs> like what that was like, the moment when the introduction came to be? You know, in the beginning. I think it was. I feel like that was... I would Do you remember that day? The day? No, the day, the, the, hour. Yeah, the day, the hour. I remember freezing the on the The barometric porch. pressure. Yeah, yeah, it was cold. It was cold. I think a lot of this ended up probably in our overview and our proposal for the book. Nice. Yeah, to be honest. Yeah. So, um, well, it sets it up. It sets it up. It sets it up. The field quality on this book, I've been wanting to tell you, it's so, this thing's built like a tank. <laughs> like, this, this is a, it literally is like a life book because it's going to live with you the rest of your life. It's got to survive. So little, yeah. Modern pioneers. The spine on it, I mean, this could take a leg in. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And as we read, you'll notice when you get the book that there are a little call up boxes and quotes and trivia, stuff like that. So as she reads the introduction, I'll chime in with the little call up boxes and then she'll do the same thing. Yay! So yes, I wanted to start out, this is actually it really is part, like, one of my favorite parts of the book is the introduction. So here we go. Picture this. I feel like we need, like, a little soundtrack. In a world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Picture this. In the middle of an economic downturn, people lose their traditional jobs and find themselves immersed in the fickle gig economy. Home cooking and baking are mainstays in meal preparation. Families make difficult choices about how they're going to spend the little money they have. A pandemic spreads across the nation. Clever resourcefulness takes a front row seat, and people tackle DIYs with newfound aplomb. Mental illness and addiction affect large numbers of vulnerable people. Individuals find comfort and love in unconventional family structures. Environmental disasters destroy lives, homes, and businesses. People seek ways to live sustainably. People of color experience racism at the hands of law enforcement. Protests and unrest mount in the face of increasing inequity. Bullying and mobbing ruin lives and social standing. Arts, crafts, and creative games become more prominent as people spend more time at home. Women seek independence and speak out against sexism and discrimination despite facing backlash. And individuals struggle with toxic relationships. Phew. Yeah. <laughs> Uplifting, right? Way to paint a picture. <laughs> Sounds like we a, didn't live that. <laughs> None of us lived that. Sounds like a pretty accurate description yes. of what we've been nice collectively so. living through, right? During yeah, the pandemic. Well, hold your horses, folks, because these challenges are also straight out of the book series and cult classic television show, Little House on the Prairie, which depicted life in the 1800s American frontier and starred the Ingalls family living in the newly settled Midwest. Our new normal is forcing many of us to become 21st century pioneers. With our increasingly complicated lives, we find ourselves comforted by the basics and determined to learn new skills, either by choice or necessity. This is one of our favorite Laura Ingalls Wilder quotes. I'm beginning to learn that it is the sweet, simple things of life which are the real ones after all. As young Gen X kids, we devoured the biographical series of books that began with The Little House in the Big Woods, still popular among youngsters today, and were hooked on the television series that made those stories and so much more come to life. Entire families sat in their living rooms or wood paneled basements, shacking up with the Ingalls family every Monday or Wednesday night for almost 10 years in the 1970s and 80s. 
We worried when Pa's crops got destroyed in a hailstorm. We cried and had nightmares when Mary went blind. We cheered when Laura punched that bratty Nellie Olson and felt the warm, fuzzy glow as the family loved one another fiercely through it all. As we grew into latchkey latch teens, we spent many afternoons alone in front of television reruns, and over time, we started to feel like part of the small screen families with which we shared our homes. Although both real and imagined pioneer life were fraught with trials and tribulations. I mean, one failed crop could cause the devastating loss of income for an entire year. Little House on the Prairie was a feel-good favorite that comforted us, made us laugh, and showed us that we could stand up to that playground bully or survive a parent losing a job, and that doing unto others really was the golden rule. Humans tend to look back at older times with longing and a belief that life in the past was simpler and easier to deal with, when in reality it was as complicated as our own. The show's perfect formula, where a challenge is introduced, dealt with, and generally all tied up with a heartfelt lesson in an hour's time, has never been close to reality either, of course. But the lessons on coping, creativity, and resourcefulness from the show and the books can help us navigate today's world with determination, perseverance, humility, and gratitude. The Ingalls family members are the perfect reminders of what's important, love, family, community, and integrity. And apple fritters, eat the apple fritters. <laughs> In the pages of Little House Life Hacks, we, a humor writer and a life coach, have gathered timeless gems of sage wisdom from the much-cherished book series first published in the 1930s and the show that originally ran from 1974 to 1983. The latter iconic series still lives on in syndication and through popular streaming providers, as well as in our hearts, and the former finds new fans and young bookworms every year. Our angles inspire practical advice for home, work, and relationships includes lessons in preparation and resilience when best laid plans are unexpectedly upheaved, doing the most with what you've got, tackling dreaded tasks with creativity and intention, and realizing that you actually have the power of choice in most of your daily doings. And as the world feels more harried and disconnected, we find ourselves wanting to reconnect with family, nature, and ultimately ourselves. Our hope with this book is that in addition to supplying a lovely nostalgia factor and a healthy dose of kitschy delight, we provide you with meaningful tidbits of inspiration for infusing more balance, wellness, and fun into the many aspects of your life. Seriously, who doesn't need timeless tips for creating a more meaningful love life a la Ma and Pa Ingalls? Who better to demonstrate how to manage an overwhelming workload in the face of stormy weather than Pa Angles. Who couldn't use fresh angles for maneuvering Nellie Olson style relationships while keeping your cool, maintaining integrity, and not stress eating an entire sleeve of Thin Mints? <laughs> like the pioneers experience, life often throws a raging river in our path that threatens to slow us down or change our course. But armed with wisdom, tenacity, and a strong will, we can get through it and are often pleasantly surprised at the newfound opportunities that the obstacle has opened for us. So tie on your bonnets, pull up your boots, hop into our covered wagon. Let's stake our claim on some Little House Life Hacks. Yeah. Yes. And then this closes with another gem from Laura Ingalls Wilder. But the real things haven't changed. It's still best to be honest and truthful to make the most of what we have, to be happy with simple pleasures, and to be cheerful and have courage when things go wrong. I love the table of contents here. Hack your family life. Hack your community life. Hack your faith. This is not a horror film. Hack your friendships. <laughs> You're like, I can't kill all these things. I'm not, I'm not grow them. What am I hacking? Hack is it's an aggressive word, but it's such a it's it's so functional. It's great. Yes, it is. Well, I'm gonna read one of the hacks, and this one is my favorite. Um, it's called Create and Attend Events, and this is in the uh, Hack Your Community Life. 
All right. Hack your community members. Hack your community members. Hack them on. I'm going to hack, hack up every single one of them. But yeah, I do agree. That. I was just thinking about that this morning, like just creating events, creating the thing that you need. I think oftentimes we look to others and we look outside our inner world for the things that we need. So just, you know, be your own boss. Yep. Little House Life Hack those events away. Yeah. So the hack is called Create and Attend Events. Gather more than your prairie skirt. And then there's a quote here. Oh, Here, do you? Get you gotta get close. Come on, Susie. Here. That's the best reason to have a party. No reason at all. <laughs> that's from Pa Engel, season one, episode seven, Town Party. That's so, <laughs> so hot. That's so epic. <laughs> <laughs> it's I know. It's simple. Yes. Nobody knew at the time that this was gonna like have this huge payoff so many decades later. Okay. So here we go. Then and now the best. The best meet people in the community, bang for your buck, is to host or show up at a gathering. You probably won't want to be known as the neighborhood wedding crasher or brisk buster. So look for gatherings that make sense for you. It can happen. It can. It can. Um, and then, so you try me Okay, what page are you on? I have the wrong page in my notes. Page 36. I feel like I'm in school. <laughs> We're at the Little House School of Life Hacks right now. It's time to pound some erasers. Okay, so you're reading the call boxes. There you go. And like Willie, I'm going to have to go stand in the corner. Would you like me to grab you a number two pencil for making the line marks? Okay. All right, here we go. Here's one. So you'll see in the book we have little areas of little hacks, like mini hacks. They're mini hacks. Little mini hacks in our call-out boxes. So we say save money and reuse. Create a community party box with plates, silverware cups, candles, folding chairs, and more to pass among neighbors or friends so everyone doesn't have to buy new party supplies for each gathering. For ease, fill the box with neutral colored items or choose the supplies with other group members. And who doesn't love a good party? In pioneer days, just surviving the daily grind was probably reason enough to celebrate. Despite the homestead hustle, the town folk of Walnut Grove made time to celebrate together with picnics, church socials, Founders Day celebrations, and even carnivals. There were opportunities for neighbors to say howdy, mingle, join a pie eating contest, or rope, a wild, rope, and, wild, rope and ride a wild mule. We're looking at you, Charles and Nels. I don't know if you remember that, that episode. Harriet's like, oh, don't do that, Nels. <laughs> Jump in and read too. <laughs> and have fun, uh, taking a work break and coming together to socialize and have fun help the community get to know one another outside of a quick hello at the mercantile or organizing a rescue party to save kids from a runaway caboose. Do you remember that episode? <laughs> you can take this one if you want. You don't want to be left out here. Read, read it. You want to read this one? Yeah. Okay, so during the Founders Day Festival in Walnut Grove, the aging logger, Bull of the Woods, challenged Pa in the logging competition. You remember that, right? I don't. I don't see it. Oh, darn it. So Pa, pa you know, we, he could easily won with his build, with his stature, but instead he chose to let the bull keep his pride. Good community members look out for one another and don't try to embarrass them. And kindness is the better option. Spite is up. And it is. For parties, tell me. Replace your ice with frozen berries, grapes, or citrus fruit wedges. Oh, we're all doing that already, right? We're all right? Doing that. Yeah. Your guest drinks will look festive and stay cold and refreshing. refreshing. I was this today, I was this is really random. I was watching cow videos on Instagram and they were feeding food props and food fruit props to the cows and they loved it and I was like, so do we. <laughs> you know, I love random, random. Oh, that's an extra hack for you. Yeah, I 
spend an hour doom scrolling cow videos on Instagram. I'm saying the more you know, random yeah. stuff, sorry. All right, spending time with others you like is beneficial for your physical and mental well-being. When you feel more connected, you have lower rates of anxiety and depression and higher self-esteem, and you tend to feel more empathetic towards others. No wonder Pa rarely suffered from anything more than a milling wheel injury and farming mishap. In general, Pa was the heart of Walnut Grove, and connecting with others was his specialty. Human conduit. Yes, we wanted to say warming cockles was his specialty, but the, uh, the editors... That's the, <laughs> that's the cologne I'm wearing right now. Warming cockles. Warming cockles, yeah. <laughs> That's right, yeah. I got it at Target. <laughs> so maybe you'd rather take on something slightly low-key. So how about inviting a few people over for a game night combined with a wine tasting? Cover the wine bottle labels and have a blind taste test along with a vote. The winner gets a fancy bottle of vino to take home. We think Mr. Edwards would have been down with this idea, only he'd replace wine with moonshine. Oh. Please note, we do not endorse this substitution. Yeah. But you can. <laughs> <laughs> you if like. We fill the wine bottles with isopropyl alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> you all have four hours to live. <laughs> Horrible game. Entertaining neighbors in your home might feel intimidating. You've got the morning dirty breakfast pans on the stove, and you know there's dog hair, cat hair everywhere. What do you do? Anglican priest Jack Queen coined the modern term scruffy hospitality. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah, scruffy hospitality. Um, which means deciding not to give a flying flat doodle whether your house is picked up or those dishes are in your sink. It's perfectly normal and healthy to have pride in your home and want to show it off at its best. But if your high personal standards keep you from enjoying your house with others, you're missing out. After all, the people in your house are what makes it a home. Chances are, if your guests see some dishes on your counter, they're feeling relieved that they're not the only ones who put up household chores. I know that's that's me all the time. I know. You can even make all you modern minimalists out there just chill. <laughs> <laughs> Bring some tchotchkes and knickknacks back in your house. So you feel better, better. I feel like nobody's dealing with that. Either. Okay, you can even make it easy on yourself and call for a potluck. Better yet, invite guests to bring musical instruments. And call it a full fledged hoot nanny. Yeah. Love that. Who's, who likes a good hoot nanny? Oh, yeah. 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 Hello. Well, Jody's good at hoot nannies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Originally known as rummage sales, garage or yard sales became a neighborhood event in the 50s and 60s. They were the result of increased advertising and affluence when people were accumulating more stuff than they could use. Oops. <laughs> we just had a huge neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Barbecues, holiday get-togethers, farmers markets, garage sales, and block parties are just a sampling of the possible community smorgasbord options. Maybe your neighborhood garage sale results in selling your junk just to spend that money on somebody else's. Yeah. <laughs> but remember that it's also another opportunity to check in on Marge's elderly pet iguana or ask little Billy how he did at the science fair. And that woman down the street who bought that repeat deck of tarot card you received as a gift, suddenly they realize that she's into the woo-woo just like you. <laughs> How lucky are you to have a variety of opportunities to keep connected and celebrate with one another? Just pick a day and drum up some togetherness. And then this ends with unpack the hack. At the end of every uh, at the end of every chapter, there's an unpack the hack, which is sort of a, a, a more involved than just you know make some ice cubes. <laughs> <laughs> So this one is, uh, invite your guests to create a collaborative playlist for your next party. On the invitation, ask them to drop their song choices into your social media DMs or text or email them to you. Be clear if you're looking for a specific theme or genre to match your party's tone. It might be a little jarring to hear Guns N' Roses at your intimate dinner party. <laughs> but maybe that jangles your chain and so you do you. Caroline Eagle swears by the fiddle heavy playlist, but she's sleeping with the band. <laughs> <laughs> Start a gourmet dinner club. Even if gourmet turns into an excuse to drink some two buck chip, Charles' favorite wine, and laugh together, this is a great way to make a regular date night with your friends and neighbors. Have the host plan the meal and assign each person a dish or wing it, literally by ordering pizza and wings and call it good. Take a cue from Little House Schoolhouse and let the kids in the neighborhood create a play. On performance day, everyone can get together, enjoy the creativity and fun, collect cash or non-perishable items, and donate them to a charity drive for your local shelter.
So that's just a little sampling of the kinds of things that you find in this book. And there's 10 chapters, and each one of them uh, is dedicated to a different part of your life, like relationships or work. Or the pillars of life. The pillars of life, yes, exactly. So it's, you, you can tell it's a great gift book, too. Yeah, very much. Yeah, there's a lot of novelty. It's functional. It's humorous. Mm -hmm. You know what happens when you pair a practical, vivacious, humorous. There's more words. I'm not going to use those words. But yeah, anyway, I was like, what, what? you get an, a book that's it's functional and humorous. That's it's right. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It tastes good, too. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we're ready. Tastes like Pa's chest hair. Oh. <laughs> wow, that one just kind of like, oh my gosh. Oh, that was somebody else's. Uh, that was mine. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, say that's chest hair. Oh, so I think we're ready for some questions. Oh, yeah, Julie, you're Justin, climb out of the hole, Justin. All right, we're gonna do some trivia. We've got some giveaways. You guys wanna maybe answer some well, questions? Well, actually, we've got. Oh, we're gonna do. Oh, I thought we were going right into trivia. No, Are we doing like? Oh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. I thought we were doing giveaways. I'm, I'm a corporate MC by day, so I was like, oh, we're gonna do giveaways. Great. Well, we do have giveaways. We have a car. We're giving away a car. Yeah. Any questions for the authors here? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. on the show well boy you know I think for me the, the pilot when you know they're leaving the big woods and it opens up with the, the wagon kind of pulling away and I'm gonna cry it's so sad Aww. but it's sweet because they're like leaving their home and they're heading out to like a new land and Laura's talking about how the, um, the windows there's there's uh, uh, in the windows there's curtains and there's lights on and it looked like that the house had eyes Oh, it was, you know, it was sad, yeah. It was sad. sad. It was sad. But it was such a great uh, lesson, and, you know, it's okay to be brave and to pick up and do something new, and that you're going to have, maybe you're going to leave some things behind, but you're also going to find community where you're going, and you're going to find things that are exciting and fun and different. And they moved a lot. They did. And I, we found that... Uh, what would you like to hear the timeline? Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you can maybe explain a little bit yeah. why they moved so often. Well, uh, in 1867, Laura was born in Pepin, a little house in Big Woods. And then in 1870, they moved to Kansas. 1871, they came back to Pepin. 1874, they moved to Walnut Grove. 1876, they went to Burr Oak, Iowa. 1878, they came back to Walnut Grove. 1879, they moved to Dismet, South Dakota, and then uh, that's when the long winter happened, wiped out the whole town. But, you know, the TV show takes place in Walnut Grove for the most part, but it's interesting that they live so many places, right? Well, yeah, I mean, you find out when you read the books, and again, when you're reading it as a child, it's different than reading it as an adult, because then you're looking back and you're going, wow, Ma put up with a lot <laughs> with Pa. He was a dreamer. He was a creative. He was kind of like a rock star. Yeah. He was. He was a He's musician. A a he played, yeah, he played his fill, you know. <laughs> and he just wanted to travel. And if, if something didn't work out, he just moved to somewhere else. And Ma had to put her foot down a couple times and be like, the, the girls are in school. We need to stay right. here. So it was just interesting, again, as an adult to read that. I think another thing to answer your question, we both love the Christmas at Plum Creek episode so much. I feel like that's a lot of people's favorite episodes. It's right in the first season. And so they're having their first Christmas in on the prairie. And just, it's so sweet how they're all finagling who's going to get Ma, what, or Pa, and all of those things. You know, I don't want to have any spoilers for you. <laughs> you watch the show. You don't remember from 25 years ago or whatever. But... Yeah, the tinfoil star. Well, we don't want to give our, our trivias away. There's no tinfoil star. <laughs> Any other questions? Did you go to uh, Pepin to see the original? We have not been to Pepin. We 
went to Walnut Grove and spent some time there a few times. And uh, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum in Pepin. And they, is that money. the gift shop? Yes, we nice. spent some money <laughs> at the gift <laughs> shop. <laughs> I think we can bring it back. Bring it back, yeah. Bring it back, the bonnet. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so Pepin has actually contacted our, our PR person and they want us to come and do something there. So that's the 50th anniversary. Next year's the 50th anniversary. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. But really, I mean, Walnut Grove's just a couple hours south of here. It's a really easy drive down 169. And I don't know, next year is the 50th anniversary and there's going to be a ton of cast members there. It's in July. So it's they're expecting, yeah, a lot, a lot of people are going to be there. A great solo adventure for a lot of folks here. Solo adventure? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, because I want to go with Angie. <laughs> Double solo adventure. It's <laughs> not the same person. Twinning adventure. True, true. Any other questions? Yes. Um, what were some of the things you found out about the cast members? in real life that struck you, or I know there are a few things that appear in the book. Mm -hmm. um, That's a great question. Do you have some favorite facts or trivia about cast members? Well, I always love finding out, um, I think I did know this, but you know, of course you forget some of these things, that um, Michael Landon, you know, he wrote all the scripts. Um, incredible, incredible screenwriter, I mean, you think about that. Um, he was Jewish. And that book is very, or the, the TV show, and the books, but I mean the TV show was very based on the Christian faith. That was their, the family's faith. And, um, but what was great about that is I think the way that he made sure to bring a lot of different topics up, you know, that, that looked at other faiths, and also the way many different people live their lives. Uh, you know, he was really groundbreaking in that way. I mean. That's one of the things we did think about when we were writing the book. We were a little, you know, there's some things that are kind of cringy, really cringy in the book. And they, it was better in the TV show, but you know, this is still from the 70s. You know, so Laura, things that age well. Yeah, Laura dressing up as a Native American and things like that. You know, and but that's the, that's the way it was back then. And that's the way it was in the 70s. And we can't erase that. You know, it's part of our history and we can learn from it. And so, um, we can always do better. yeah, we can always do better. But anyway, so yeah, that, I think that was one of the things that I loved thinking about how he was so good at understanding what faith was for the Ingalls, even though that wasn't his faith. But really, I mean, it's just such a great lesson to all of us. But it's really all the same, you know, it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think also in the same um, vein with him writing the scripts. One of the, we read a few of the, almost probably all of the, uh, the memoirs of the cast members, and there was, I can't remember which one this was from, but he was always writing. Like, he would be, he would be acting in one episode while writing the next episode. Like, that's how, he didn't, like, take a bunch of time and write episodes. He was, like, down to the wire every single episode he was writing the next one, and so. For ten seasons. Yeah. Nine. Nine. nine well, nine. Yeah. There were nine seasons. Nine seasons? Nine seasons? Nine, <laughs> nine seasons is not really, I don't know, it's not my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's jump the shark, by the Jump the wagon. Jump the wagon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why don't we give out some, uh, some swag? Some swag? Yeah. Are, we ready for, are you ready for some swag? Are you ready for some <laughs> trivia? <laughs> All right, it's time to play, play Little House Life Hacks Trivia. We're all afraid now. You're like, wow, this is kind of really intense. Okay, I'll try not to project too much. Okay. So just to give you an idea of what we're working with here, a little motivation. So we got some, some, some buttons and some pets. That tingles my ankles. That tingles my ankles. Okay, this is for. I thought they were going to be much smaller. Yeah. I thought they were going to be these little, like, you know, 80s little bits. You're like, no. That's a, that's a super great cover. It's a beret. Yeah. yeah, you can just wear it in your hair. Okay, so first question Who was the town veterinarian? Lars Hansen or Hiram Baker? First person, raise your hand. Tickles my ankles. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
go. So you should get it. You get it. Yeah. And now you know. You you raise your hand, everybody. So all you have to do is raise your hand. Hey, Justin. Give one to this gentleman back here, too. Oh, yes. to my fritter. <laughs> Little house like that. <laughs> These are great premiums, by the way. <laughs> There's like a ghost fly messing with you right fly. now. Yeah. All right. Who on the show was known for wearing, where did it just go? It was the lemon verbena. <gasps> lemon ver okay, oh. lemon verbena. Okay, lemon verbena. Lemon verbena perfume. Miss Needle, of course. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> Medicinal benefits of lemon verbena. What's one? I don't remember. Okay. Sights, anxiety, and depression. You see, you know. I don't know. It helps students learn. There we go. Okay. Yeah. And you just feel good. It smells great. Who was the Ingalls first? What was the dog's first name? Does anybody know? Jack. Yeah. Jack. What do you have now? Pen. Yes. Does anybody remember the second dog in the series? Bandit. Bandit. Hey! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. Yeah, there's one. Right, we'll have some more trivia over there. No, no. Bandit actually was a Universal Studios show dog. And so, yeah, so he was, uh, he worked there. He was a working dog. He was a working dog. That dog was probably making the most money on the show. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Who thought they had, quote unquote, the vapors, but was diagnosed instead with a case of bad flatulence? <laughs> was it Nelly or was it Harriet? Nelly. You raised your hand. <laughs> It was Harriet. Oh, okay. yep. It was a hilarious episode. And then Harriet was so offended. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. She was thinking the papers. The papers. Oh, those papers. She was reading it in a book. She thought it was like this glamorous thing to have the vapors. The I think that's a great way to reference when so if you do smell somebody that's just past gas. Yeah. To just be like, oh, those, the those vapors. Guys, those vapors. Oh, those the ungodly vapors. Get into my nostrils. That was a bad case of vapors, is right. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, the vapors. You have to be a woman to have vapors. The vapors. Yeah. Okay, this is a Laura question. What did Laura put in the cinnamon chicken recipe Nelly cooked for Almanzo? Mm -hmm. uh, Do you know what that ingredient is? To, yeah. To, to mess with her. To mess with her. So it's not an ingredient you would typically put. Cinnamon and cinnamon chicken. So something a little like pungent, hot on the nostrils. Not hot sauce, but an ingredient in the hot sauce. Raise your hand. Cayenne pepper. Oh, oh, tell them about that one. That's my favorite. This is a fridge magnet. Yeah, but tell them what it is. Read it. Oh, oh. <laughs> My ADHD was getting it. It's so tiny to me. Oh my god. It says current mood, Laura, and then current mood, Nelly. Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. So you get all the people in your house to know how you're feeling that day. <laughs> So we have one more. Oh, here we go. 
a quote. <laughs> Who said it? Who said, I drink. I can't find whiskey. I drink cough remedies. I drink. Isaiah or Albert? Raise your hand. Is that it? So that's it. That's it for the prizes. Wrap it up. But first, oh, it went right. so fast. Do we want to talk about oh, yes. the potato? We have the, the final potato. prize. The final prize. One prize to rule them all. The greatest prize. A Yukon gold. <laughs> <laughs> What's the significance of the potato? Well, we'll tell you after we get a winner. We got to get a winner. So. Okay, how are we going to do this? Everybody. Reach under the lip oh, yes. of your chair, and whoever has a sticker under there gets the potato. Gets it's not quite oh, Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. In the front of your chair. You get to go to Dr. Hopefully Utah's there's not any potato AC gum. <gasps> oh my god. We have a winner. <laughs> and it's a Nelly sticker. And is it this potato and right here? They get that potato. That you get this potato. <laughs> and we'll tell you why. So, other than, you know, they ate a lot of potatoes, um, potatoes were also used to warm their hands. They would heat them up and then put them in their pockets when they were walking through the cold Minnesota or South Dakota or, or Iowa. <laughs> Not California, where the show was filmed, <laughs> where you could see green trees behind the fake snow. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I'm not sure if that potato will last long enough into the winter for you to warm it up. Right. <laughs> We're challenging you to survive a Minnesota winter with that one Just potato. With that one potato. <laughs> Gonna fight off scurvy. <laughs> And the thermodynamics and will keep you alive. And car moonshine out there. There we go, yes. You can also just sell it down. That's not in the hook, though. That's, a, that's an off-the-book hack. Off-the-book Yeah. That's too hot for the book hack. Yeah. 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 I got cut. That's the director's cut. <laughs> that's, that's for the red band book. Yeah. 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 We have a question. All right, what's your question? We don't have a book yet. Mm -hmm. Well, we well there's this, all this information all right here. Information. So we're this let's we're gonna wrap things up now. Do you wanna like, you know, hang out a little bit, maybe get a book signed? Yeah. You're gonna be up front yeah. doing a book signing. We've got a stack of books right up there. All right. Yeah. Also, Thanks for joining where, us. Where do we watch these? We're, we're older than this. What's the best streaming platform or network to catch episodes? Amazon And then we're also going to be continuing things beyond this point at Malcolm Yards. If anybody wants to join If anybody us. would like to join. Yeah, yeah, we wanted to take the party. If anybody wants to hang out and have a drink with us and some food, we're going to head if, um, over to Malcolm Yards. I actually, it should be easy to find, but I will give you the address. It's uh, 501 30th Avenue South. Right over in Prospect Park. Surly's over there. It's another... Landmark. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, yes. And uh, you should be trying a little bookmark on your. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. on the yeah, seats. Those are actually bookmarks, even though they look like business cards. Yeah, oh. yeah, they're tidy little bookmarks on the back of our social media okay. handles. So if you'd like to follow us on social media, then there you go. We're there. And uh, yeah, remember these are great gifts and signed books. Great We're getting close to that season. It's yeah. weirdly like not that far from gift buying things, and yeah, this is a great little book. Too. The Christmas decorations are already out at Costco. So. Uh, right, I know. Kind of they don't wait. They just skipped Halloween there, but yeah. that's another day, another conversation. Thank you so much for joining us one more time. For our amazing authors, Will House, Light Packs now available. And I want to say a thank you to Justin.
Kristen yeah. for being here with us tonight and making this so much fun. And really a big thank you to all of you who yes. have supported us. I mean, so many friends out there and family. And I want to say thank you to Angie. Now I'm going to cry. We have been friends for over 25 years. We met when our girls were taking a dance class. There's one of the girls. She's not in a tutu anymore. Uh, <laughs> we were both in tutus. It's like you got a college kid of a friendship. We do? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we were fast friends right away. And we kind of, you know, how things go. We moved away from each other. We got back together. And um, I have to say, our working relationship has been like a dream. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people wonder, well, how did two people write one book? And with Angie, it was so easy. Oh, that guy, yeah, it was really fun. It was three years, but it was really fun. And we just passed chapters back and forth to each other. And yeah, one of us would kind of start a chapter, and then we'd pass it to the next person, and they would add, and then we would kind of go through and hack hack at the chapters, and when one of us wasn't feeling it, the other one would pick it up, and it just worked out so crazy well. So thank you for being on this trail And back, yeah, love you. Healthy relationships create healthier books, yeah. among other things. And thank you to Majors and Quinn for hosting. Yes, yeah. big round of applause. One of the greatest bookstores in the Twin Cities. I, uh, you can find me on Instagram. I'm Justin Jones, so it's J U S T E N Jones. I host a show called Justin Versus. It's on YouTube. I take I take on the fair every year, so all the all the episodes are up, so you can see me at the fair. And I do movies. And TV. We met. We met. We met. This is great. Any Twin Cities Live fans out there? So they had uh, they had a guest co-host week. And it was like a casting call contest, and we entered, and we each got to host one day on Twin Cities, co-host a day on Twin Cities Live. Yeah, and so we met through that. Yeah, we didn't know each other. We didn't know each other, no. And then and then I was in a horror movie <laughs> called The Control Group with Brad Dourif, Billy Bibbitt from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, oh. and Grim Warm Tongue from, from Lord of the Rings. And you were there, and that was just like, boom, you showed up, and I was like, wow, this is so supportive and amazing. And then that's just the lit up, the friendship just went boom. It's a yeah. combination. Great. <laughs> we had coffee not too long ago, and Angie and I met formally for the first time, and it, well, I was like, oh my gosh, am I Gen X? I know I'm an elder millennial, but I feel way more Gen X. An elder, an elder millennial. Anyway, it's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.